Hello, my name is Amelia and I'm one of community managers at CD Projekt Red. A while back, members of our Polish forum community reached out to see if we could ask my friend Smith a few of their questions about Cyberpunk 2020 and its lore. So when Erta Sarian crew visited our studio in Warsaw, we saw that as the perfect opportunity to sit down with Mike and talk some Cyberpunk. Enjoy the video! Hey Mike, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm perfect, I'm here with you. Uh, we've gathered some questions from our Polish community over forums, uh, so if you don't mind, let's jump I'm into it. I'm all ears, let's okay. do it. Okay, first question is from PlanX. Where do you get your inspiration regarding cyber technology and its development? Actually, I get it through a lot of research. Um, it's funny because I start my day by reading lots and lots of uh, magazines, online information, science books, so forth like that. And I'm always looking for something that will be applicable to the stuff we're designing, because one of the big things that we want to do is make sure it's realistic. So we go through, actually I go through tons and tons of books, and then people on the staff also find interesting things. At Telsorian, we actually have had people who, that was their entire job, doing research, we had uh, subscriptions to Jane's Defense Weekly and you know, uh, NSA journals and all kinds of things like that, so that we could stay up to date. Second question is from the procrastinator. Uh, would you be able to pinpoint specific elements that you think differentiate your cyberpunk from other famous representatives of the mm -hmm. genre and make your own? Some theme or maybe focus on certain elements uh, that make CP stand out? Well, the thing of it is, when we did a cyberpunk RPG, we had an interesting problem, which is if you, as in most typical cyberpunk, end up being a gentleman loser, but you lose, uh, it's not really fun to do in a role-playing game. Yet at the same time, the nature of cyberpunk is that it is not about heroes, per se. It's about people who are little heroes, heroes for themselves. So what we had to come up with was something where you weren't a uh, badass hero, but that you were a competent, capable person in a very bad world. So that also means that the world has to be more than just a basic dirty streets, rain, neon, and so forth like that. If you're going to build a real world, you have to ask, when is it cyberpunk even during the daylight? Why is it cyberpunk during the daylight? Um, how do people live? Where do they eat? How do they sleep? You assume they do sleep. You know, how do they relate to the cyberware and the gear that they have? For example, in a lot of classic cyberpunk, the hardware is treated as though it is actually some kind of superpower. It is not an everyday thing. But we use, for example, cell phones now, smartphones, that would be considered during the time I wrote this to be just unbelievable devices. I've written entire books on my phone. And yet we don't think twice about that now. We go, yeah, I got a new cell phone. We don't distinguish it as being a special piece of technology. If you live in an environment where people can change body parts, go down and pick them up at the mall and so forth like that, it's going to become closer to getting a tattoo. It's gonna be closer to chosen surgery. Um, it's not quite a tummy tuck, but it's getting there. All right. So it's uh, more like you mentioned in one of our videos, uh, mm -hmm. cyberpunk is not about saving humanity, it's about saving yourself. It's about saving yourself and the things you care about. Which in the end, most people don't stop and think about really, really large concepts when they're getting up in the morning. Oh, I'm going to join capitalism now. You know, no, they're thinking, I gotta go to work. <laughs> well, if going to work means uh, I gotta go down to the 1711, and I gotta go pick up some soy milk, and you live in a very dangerous neighborhood, you pull up your nine millimeter and you load it and you check your load and everything like that as you go out the door. I don't think I want to live in that kind uh, of city. The funny part <laughs> is, yeah, I wouldn't really want to live in that world either, um, but I understand it, and there are elements of it I think are just starkly beautiful. There's a certain sort of film noir beauty to it, and that I would never want to give up. And the wonderful part about it is 
you know, we may not all have the cyberware, but we have places in the real world that are really like that and have that strange kind of beauty. According to your communication so far, uh, Cyberpunk Red is supposed to take place in the same world as Cyberpunk 2077. Oh yeah, but we you spent a lot of time dealing with that, make sure it fits. But you had been thinking of Cyberpunk Red even before you started your cooperation with us. Therefore, I would like to know how much has the above cooperation in Cyberpunk 2077 affected your original plans regarding Cyberpunk Red, its timeline, its world, or even its gameplay mechanics. Actually, it's really funny because it's almost like fate wanted us to be together. For example, I named Cyberpunk Red, Cyberpunk Red before I ever met you guys, before I even knew you existed. Really? Uh, yes. Um, here's the thing. We oftentimes, in our projects at Talsorian, we color code things. They get code names. Um, so Cyberpunk Red, because the original graphic design has red elements all through it, it was codenamed Cyberpunk Red, as opposed to the previous piece, which was actually Cyberpunk Green, and then eventually had a regular name attached to it. So we didn't know about you guys then. So many things actually have stayed the same. And it's been fascinating because I'm working with uh, Patrick, for example, and your staff, and he and I do a lot of the coordinating of timelines. And a lot of times Patrick will say, well, we, we really need to have this. And I'll go, oh, we already got that. And he'll go, what? And I'll go, yeah, we had to <laughs> do this. And we figured it out like five years earlier. All what right. happened was um, we wanted to simplify and make the cyberpunk world more challenging again. It had gotten very staid, very boring. So what we did instead was we said, okay, can we cut back on the not level of technology, but the amount of it. Can we change the corporate players? Can we put a more exploration-based, more challenging arrangement of how things are done in that world? And that led to things that actually would evolve quite naturally into Cyberpunk 2077. So all we really had to do in the end is sit down and go, okay, up here in Cyberpunk, 2077, uh, for example, Militech is like this. Way back here in 2020, Militech is like this. There's been a war. What happened in between the two? And at the end of it, Patrick would say, well, we need to have it come out like this. And I would go, okay, well, we're here. So I'm willing to have it come up to this. Now, meanwhile, I'd really like to have a corporation that is a big corporation in Cyberpunk 2077 so can I start it over here and have you guys start putting the signage on the buildings up here? That's really interesting. It's very cooperative and like I said, it's funny how oftentimes we will talk about something. Yeah. Uh, for example, there was a plotline character that we had to work around and Patrick came to me and said, I'm really worried because we have to do something with this character. And I said, Oh, okay, so you have to like kill them back here. Yeah, we did that. You did? Yeah, we, we set it up and we killed them. <laughs> but we also arranged that there was a way we could get it back when we needed to, yeah. you know, but it was all set up because we had a very similar set of goals, which was to make the world more interesting and more cyberpunk. Oh, all right, let's go for another one. Uh, okay. Another question from Planex. How does your creative workshop look like? <laughs> Do you have any favorite places or tools to work on Cyberpunk? Oh, uh, yeah, actually I have two creative workshops. I have the, my office at Telsorian, which is really more the business side of things. Um, I also do a lot of the layout and graphic stuff there because we have a lot of machines for that. We have like printers and uh, specialty devices, 3D printers, etc. But my main writing office actually is a kind of a cubby hole in one part of the house. And it's not very big. It's packed with bookshelves all around me. So I can immediately kind of grab whatever I'm working on. So I have bookshelves on like three sides. And then an enormous table where I can spread everything out mm. until Lisa says, I can't get in this room anymore. <laughs> and then I have to move some stuff. And then a lot of toys. Um, I work better when I have toys around. So at any given point, I'll have, you know, um, G.I. Joes, some Transformers, you know, a lot of very, very interesting and silly things. Plus, 
touchstones for what I'm working on. For example, um, I picked up a 3D model that someone did of the handgun that V has in the trailer, and I have that holding the papers out on my desk because it reminds me of like what people do with weapons at that point. But no plushies? Uh, no plushies. The plushies are all back in the bedroom. But I'm going to horrify people by telling them, yes, I actually have a couple <laughs> of My Little Pony statues. Oh, wow. But they also have machine guns, so yeah, you figure that one out. Yeah. OK, uh, let's go to another one. OK. Uh, by Pakcio and Hunt Moce, one of our moderators. Uh, how would you rate your stay in Poland as a tourist? How does Poland present itself compared to the rest of the world? Would you see a potential for representing Poland in Cyberpunk Red Universe? What could be the biggest differences between today's Poland? It's like Poland? a million questions. Why don't, <laughs> yeah. why, don't we, why don't we pause and I'll take a couple of them and you can okay. kind of keep going. So the first couple, one, I love Poland. Poland is lots of fun. I like the people here. I like the environment. Poles are crack up. You guys have this really dry sense of humor and occasionally very, very sarcastic <laughs> and it just fits. Uh, and I, I have made a lot of friends here that even if I wasn't coming into work here, I would still want to come back and visit. Um, a couple of our friends, for example, on the staff, uh, for example, uh, the uh, studio managers and so forth, one just had a kid. We went out, we bought toys for the baby. So we have friends here. So uh, cool. And Poland is great. Um, the other thing is that I like the fact that it has history and it's old, but yet, where it's modern, it's new, everybody's managed to integrate that. Mm -hmm. And another thing I do is I love the food. <laughs> Polish food is great. Um, I, there's a uh, sour soup, and I liked sour soup, zurek. Uh, mm, zurek. Zurek. Polish is not a language I do well. But yeah, I liked it so much that I convinced a local importer back home in Seattle to bring it in in cans so I could have it when I wanted it. Because <laughs> they won't let me bring it back on the plane. Yeah, obviously. So, um, you're saying representing next, uh, was it? Would you see a potential for representing Poland in Cyberpunk Red Universe? Uh, what could be the biggest difference uh, based on your observation during your stay in Poland? It's going to be interesting. Poland is uh, definitely going to get represented. We're working on the notes for what's happening in a new Euro source book. Um, because of the Fourth Corporate War being a very specific, limited war, it means that a lot of places that were not critical for military control were left relatively untouched. So Warsaw, Poznan, many of the towns here were not center of banking or military operations. So neither Militech or Arasaka were you know, interested in fighting their wars there. So they were left pretty much untouched. Uh, on the other hand, Paris looks very bad right now. London looks worse. Oh. So one of the things that's interesting is places like Warsaw are now becoming new centers for how Europe is reorganizing after the fourth corporate war. So I think there'll be quite a bit of area there where Poland can play and people can play in Poland. That would be, that would be something that I'm sure a lot yes. of people from our community would like to see. Well, not only that, but now I know a lot more than I did 10 years ago. That's true as well. Next one. Shoot. Uh, by Shavot. You have mentioned multiple times your inspirations for Cyberpunk 2013 and Cyberpunk 2020, mm -hmm. such as Blade Runner or Walter mm -hmm. Jones Williams' work. Uh, has there appeared any new inspiration since that time? Will that affect Cyberpunk Red? Oh, there's tons and tons of them. That's the problem. There's so many because when, you know, I first started writing this, there were not a lot of cyberpunk pieces of literature out there. Um, in fact, I was the other day looking at uh, Walter John's uh, Hardwired again, and I went, wow, I, I, I'm seeing where I got all those influences from. And it didn't hurt that Walter was one of the play testers on the game originally. So now I look at actually real world things as well. Uh, I look at how people have built mobile communities. I look at how people use cybernetics. I'm really fascinated by how they integrate technology into their lives without even thinking about it. Uh, we have a joke thing that just happened last week where I bought a bulletproof backpack. 
yeah, which is silly, one. but people argue all the time about, you know, are, are our mechanics for bulletproofing realistic? So the bulletproof backpack's gonna be taken out onto the range and we're gonna shoot a bunch of holes in it to find out where the holes go and how long it takes to destroy it. But I was fascinated by the fact that this was now a world where I could buy a bulletproof backpack. Um, or I could buy a, I bought a new TV a couple months ago, and my TV is a combination of satellite dish, TV, recording system, computer, and you know, it's, my whole wall is filled with it. That's an amazing thing. We have all of this great stuff and we take it for granted, but when I look at it in the context of what was happening way back in 2020 or 2013, I go, we have traveled an immense distance. Yet at the same time, we're coming to grips with how we live with that technology and what our world is gonna be like. So a lot of it, you know, there's classics, Ghost in the Shell, Appleseed, for example, uh, Shirao's work, I love that. Um, there are you know, just references from Star Wars to, to Star Trek to whatever that always come into the just kind of the mix. But how it's used and how I then make it come into red is mostly about how people use it here and now and what that says. For example, we have a group of young people that we're going to be featuring as characters in Cyberpunk Red and they all have prostheses of some form or another. You know, cyber, literally cyber arms and cyber legs and so forth like that. And I was fascinated, I wanted to get these people into the book because they were living what we just talk about. And that was amazing. Yeah, they're and, a cyberpunk. And yes, they are cyberpunk and they're great guys too. And awesome. girls. Now another question from mm -hmm. Co Tam Chcesz. What kind of feeling is this to know that very soon your paper child will grab the keys to a shiny super fast CP27 motorbike and smash the windows with its engine's roar? <laughs> ah, it is astounding. Every time I come back here and I see what you guys have done, I'm blown away. But I'm also because of the massive amounts of secrets that we keep on all this project. <laughs> I have to go back and not tell anybody. So I get back, my staff goes, what'd you see, Mike? And I go, what I can't tell you about is what I saw. <laughs> um, this time around, looking at marketing, looking at, uh, I, I just got to see the new music. I got to see a new animation set, um, new character stuff, new voice acting. And I am amazed. And I'm also really pretty humbled because I'm walking through an enormous building now and I've watched you guys grow from you know, like one and a half floors of this building to this building, the next building, a studio in Krakow and everywhere else. So I sort of watched my kid grow right now. Oh, that's super cool. And I'm amazed because all of these really talented, really cool, fun people are working on something I came up with. And I feel honored that they think it's worth doing that and that that much raw brain power and talent is being put on something that, you know, a bunch of years back, I was sitting there with a beer in one hand and my apple in the other and typing away going, hmm, I think I'll call it Arasaka. <laughs> I would have never imagined a big computer building designed with Arasaka on a logo that I came up with in 10 minutes on my old apple using paint. Well, so I'm astounded. We try our best. You do well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, that's gonna be the last question mm -hmm. um, from Michał Wojtas. He's actually from Facebook. Uh, hey, Michał. <laughs> what kind of technology would you update your old setting with Ooh. to make the technology progress similar to the historical one? What is your approach regarding such updates? Actually, it's interesting because we've been going through this at work. Um, what we discovered was because Cyberpunk 2020 and Cyberpunk 2013 originated back in a time when a lot of the technologies we used were beginning, 
there are sort of natural split points built into them. It's kind of like, well, we could be a bird here or a dinosaur here, but we yeah. both were this lizard here. And that's very true. For example, people talk about net running and they go, well, that's not much like the net that we have. And I'm going, well, yeah, but the net you have comes from, you know, the net we use every day comes from basically hypercard stacks that were a brand new idea and which were primarily driven by, if I remember correctly, by Apple and, you know, the Apple interfaces. If you don't have that, and we didn't have the equivalent of Apple in the 2020 universe, you don't get a hyper stack and thus, um, you know, web page driven net. So how does that net work? So we literally looked at it and said, well, probably, you know, would have had to come out of DARPA nets and all the others. So right now, it kind of looks a lot like uh, CompuServe. And the reason why you have all these cool flying through space interfaces is nobody ever invented web pages. There was nothing to drive them. And the hardware to actually operate in that space was invented by military people who couldn't lug a, a big monitor around. You know, the big 50. Yeah. I, I have monitors from the, you know, the early days of the company still around to remind me. And, you know, and I have a monitor that's like that and you know, weighs 25 pounds. People go, why do you have this? And I go, because I can appreciate this widescreen monitor that is the size of my couch and <laughs> weighs five pounds. Yeah. And, and, but the thing is, the military of that time had to go into black ops and things. And once they had developed biologic chips that could plug in your optic nerves and other nerves, it was a quick jump from, forget about the screen, I'm gonna plug the screen right into your eyes. Forget about the power glove, which would have been a way you would have done it in the 80s. Forget about that, I'm just gonna wire it straight into your nervous system and you'll open up stuff and move files. So, you know, the equivalent of that is a very different net. Some things would change, some things don't. Um, for example, cell phones do a lot more, but we invented a thing, oddly enough, in Cyberpunk V3 called the Agent, that is basically a smartphone, and it drives the same way. And we would probably have more of that now. Um, vehicles are still gonna be running mostly on electric or internal combustion, because it works. Guns still shoot some type of you know compressed explosive because they shoot underwater, they shoot in space, they shoot when you need them, you can trade ammo around. We're sitting in front of a gun wall there of which about a third of each of these weapons can trade ammo. Yeah. So if two of them are laser weapons, they're not getting used by somebody if they run out of charge. So some things stay the same. Some things what we're doing is we're simplifying. Uh, we're simplifying armor quite a bit. We're simplifying how people use communications technologies because they don't need to be that big. Uh, we're simplifying food. We're you know, bringing better ways of describing day-to-day -day life because those things do change. But in the end, people are going to pick up a phone and they're going to call each other. People are going to pull out a gun and they're going to shoot the bad guys. People are going to have some kind of needle or something that's going to inject them with medicines. People are going to get in cars and drive places. Yeah, sure. You know, how those shape basically is part of the individual world. Cool. That's actually, Good. actually really yeah. insightful. All right. Thank you very much Thank for you. answering Thank all you. the questions. <laughs> uh, is there maybe anything else you would like to say to our community? Uh, well, again, my bad post, Jinkuyo for having me and for reading our stuff and being interested in what we're going to do. I promise you, it's gonna be amazing. Trust me.